and I was rooted in place and I was staring at this thing it just came up and over it came above my head and I swear to god this is the truth this cloud just went like it just sucked into itself it just collapsed into itself within a second second and a half at most and inside it was a triangle formation of orange orbs of light these orange circles in a triangle and there was I would say roughly I've kind of my ballpark has been about 25 maybe 30 of them big triangle formation of these orange balls Welcome back, everyone. I am here with Jay Anderson from Project Unity. Jay, it is an absolute pleasure to meet you. That's a pleasure to be on here, Sean. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. So you are actually well-connected in this particular field. And I want to start with, how did you get into this? Like, what led you to follow something that is so enigmatic and so, you know, just when you think you kind of understand it, it kind of floats away from you and, and manifests in something different. Yeah, well, I was never really into this subject. I haven't been a, a lifelong, you know, UFO fanatic or fan. I haven't been someone who was always watching documentaries. I had a pretty normal way of looking at life until a few years back, I'd say around maybe about 2018, 2017, 2018 is when things started changing for me. But it, it, the, the weird thing with how I got into the UFO subject is a lot of it's just very synchronistic and subjective mm -hmm. and weird. <laughs> like, and what, what I found is when I came into this field, I, I encountered so many other people that had the exact same experience of like, oh yeah, the, the, the whole way in which I ended up being interested in UFOs was because of this and this and this and all these strange things that happened on on their personal journey and it's the same for me so th there's like a, a series of ups and downs in, in my younger life in like my early 20s I'm, I'm 28 now going on 29 in, in January and it was in my early 20s when I was kind of struggling a little bit just coming out of university a lot of pressures in my life and my personal relationships at the time are kind of broken down I remember at the time I just had a breakup with my girlfriend at the time so there was a whole lot of stuff happening and and it put me into a real down place in my mind mentally and it was actually and i've said this a number of times so anyone who's listened to me talk enough has probably heard me recount this story but it was actually a series of books which is not something i would have expected but it was a series of books that kind of clicked in my mind and took me out of a depression and kind of pushed me onto a a, a path of research into consciousness and philosophy and a bit of quantum mechanics in the way I could understand it as a layman. Mm -hmm. And the books were a, a series called Conversations with God by a guy called Neil Donald Walsh. And uh, I was actually lucky enough to have him on the channel, you know, year number of years later, once this kicked off. And, and that was great because it was kind of like a full circle thing for me because his books really did kick a lot of this off. They're interesting books for anyone that hasn't read them. Whatever you think about channeled works, you know, there's plenty of uh, books out there about channeled works and, and getting downloads of information. And this is essentially what Neil Donald Walsh believes he was getting was a, a series of downloads of information what, with, from what he interprets as God. And it's interesting because e even if, because I obviously went into that very skeptically when I, when I read those books, I was extremely in, in a really bad place. Actually, I was kind of really depressed and down. And so I was like, oh, these books aren't going to do anything. I was, reading through them and it's kind of structured as like a conversation question answer question answer between him and and this voice that he was hearing in his head he was waking up at three in the morning and felt inspired to start writing on a legal pad and start getting kind of instantaneous answers to questions from a voice that he felt was separate but in his head and as crazy as that sounds what i found amazing was just that the questions and the answers were really profound like all of the kind of questions you would ask if you had a direct link to some sort of otherworldly omnipresent intelligence he was asking those questions from the small things to the big things you basically the books just have this very profound series of messages in them that woke me up to an idea about well okay maybe there is some form of you know quote unquote god it had this whole universal consciousness model that was kind of being put into this book and it gave me that it gave me enough of an idea of maybe that's a, a possibility to start exploring it through different avenues of research right
When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. So by the, by the way, have you ever run that experiment yourself? Run what experiment? Question, answer, question, answer. I mean, to be honest, and, and this is a whole thing we can get into, I've, I, like, I genuinely do have moments of what I would call the flow state, and a lot of people reference the flow state, and it happens primarily with two things. It happens when I'm playing my guitar and I'm just getting into a state where I'm not thinking about the chords and it becomes pretty effortless, and mm -hmm. that ends up being the best music, and then I try and record it, and I can never be as good as it was, you know, when I was in that flow state. You can never capture that moment again. So it happens when I'm playing on guitar, and it also does happen when I'm writing ideas. Uh, not all the time, but there are just moments where I'm feeling like there's an idea I want to write down, and it's usually quite late at night. So I'll sit up on my laptop, and I'll start typing out an idea, and within about three to four sentences, I kid you not, I'm just type, 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 like barely thinking, and it's all kind of mm -hmm. flowing out, and the idea is building, and before I know it, I've kind of written like six pages of writing, and a lot of that becomes the, which I haven't done for a little while, but on, on my YouTube channel, because a lot of it's interviews with other, other guests, but there are some presentations that I've done myself where I'm just discussing and kind of like philosophizing in my own way. And a lot of that was actually writing where I was in what I would call a flow state, where I was just typing a really, what felt like inspired in the moment, very quick information coming fast. Wouldn't say it's a voice. It's still my own kind of conscious, right. like awareness doesn't feel like it's a voice talking to me, but it certainly feels like the thoughts are being written down too fast because I'm not really thinking about what I'm writing. And then when I finish writing it, I read it back and I'm like, huh, hmm, that's actually pretty cool. And then I, I, do the presentation and a lot of times that's the kind of stuff where someone will comment and go my god i really needed to hear this and it's like huh it you know i kind of just get the feeling that it's more of being a conduit than being you know i don't think it's my brain so much as you just being a little bit open and something flowing through you like information flowing through you yeah it's like is is your brain generating your thoughts or is your brain just an antenna yeah and then and your you know brain just reference you know like yeah. the akashic records and stuff like that and I, I i i understand like i do think there is something to that that when you open yourself up in a certain way or you're in a certain creative state information can flow through you very quickly and very efficiently and that can be expressed in all sorts of ways from you know painting and, and music to nikola tesla's incredible inventions and all of the kind of intuitive creative expressions that humans have put into this world it's all come from that strange flow state that you can't really explain so just kind of getting back to how I ended up in the UFO subject was, it was actually a, a friend of mine who introduced me to Unacknowledged by Dr. Stephen Greer. And I, I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about Greer. I know he's a really controversial figure. I still think he's done great research, but I still have my own personal issues with some of the things he does. So it's certainly not. Oh yeah, I, I think uh, I think yeah. he's witting or, or unwitting, but I think he's a disinformation agent. Yeah, well, well, I think he's he's channeled so much information out into the field. I think it's almost guaranteed yeah. that some of it's disinformation, and uh, yeah, I think that's enough. you know prevalent with a lot of researchers. To be honest, is that the more you interact with some of these so-called sources, the more disinformation can be thrown onto the pit. But yeah, like Greer is, is an interesting example. But at that time, I was fresh faced. I had no idea who you know Greer was. My friend was just like, "You got to check out this documentary," and. The interesting thing about this was that the week prior, I'd been sitting on my bed. I kind of got into another bit of a slump. This is a couple years later after, you know, doing a lot of research and getting all into consciousness and philosophy and all this stuff. And I was sitting on my bed and I just kind of felt like, you know, I'm still stressed. Like I've still got bills. I've still got things to do. I'm still worried about things. 
none of this weird esoteric information's actually helped me. It's all really right. cool and like, okay, yeah, maybe we are in a universal consciousness and we're just a single expression of it manifested and, you know, exploring. Okay, cool. But what, you know, like, what does this mean for me? What can this do for me? Like, is there even any point in learning this stuff? And I kind of got into a bit of a slump over it. So I was sitting on my bed and I remember just like, you know, you can, I guess you can call it a prayer, but I just was speaking out loud to the universe. I was just talking on my bed. I was just like, look, I need something in my life that is representative of all of this stuff. Like something that proves it's real. I want to know it's actually real, like universal consciousness and non-locality and all of these ideas. I really want to know it's real. Give me something. Like if it's true, give me something. Just kind of like, you know, kind of daring the universe. Like, come on. I want, like, I'm ready now. I've learned something. Like, show me, show me. And so like a week later, my friend's like, you got to check out this documentary, Stephen Greer, Unacknowledged. And no matter what you think of Greer, Unacknowledged is a really good documentary. It's got some brilliant testimonies from some of these like, you know, high ranking military guys. It's got a lot of clips from the National Press Conference, which was historic, the 2001 National Press Conference. Mm -hmm. I mean, the amount of whistleblowers with their credentials and their military backgrounds getting up on stage. And it's never been done since, even with the, the Grush and Ryan Graves and Fravor testimonies, which are still incredible. It's just like that hasn't been repeated. So we should definitely tip our hats to Stephen Greer for getting the national press conference done. And I would even Absolutely. say as well, the, the recent national press conference he did as well has been overshadowed quite significantly because of all the controversy. And it's like, well, hang on a second. Like he got some interesting guys on there and they're worth talking about as well. But either way, this documentary was my first introduction to the UFO field. And it, it was interesting, you know, obviously there was all of these missile men and people talking about it and there was some footage and there were some claims and it was the first time I'd been introduced to it. So I was interested and it started to make sense and it seemed like there was some seriousness to it. Like there was some pretty serious individuals talking about this and I was like, all right, okay, like this is interesting. Near the end of the documentary though, is when he gets into the whole CE5 thing, the whole consciousness contact thing. And this is like, the really weird part for me, because I've been sitting on my bed that week prior and, and, and literally the moment he got into this weird subject that I'd never heard of before, this idea that you could make some sort of coherent, conscious, you know, intuitively resonant request for your mind to have some form of contact with something. And because of that request I'd made the week prior and then suddenly watching this and hearing this guy say this. For me, it, it really felt like an answer from the universe. I immediately went back to that week prior in my mind, like asking the universe for proof of, you know, un universal consciousness, non-locality. Suddenly here's a guy saying, oh, you can use your mind to have, you know, contact because of non-locality. And I was like, whoa, hang on a second. This is exactly what I was asking for. So I think that's what enabled me to actually have experiences with the phenomenon because I had absolutely zero doubt whatsoever since then, I haven't doubted the phenomenon, but I have had doubts about what it really represents. But at this time, I was like totally like a religious convert. I was just like, oh my God, I know this is real. I'm going outside. So I started going out into my back garden and it was in the summertime and I was, you know, I, I started getting into like a basic meditative state. Just, and I'm not a meditative practitioner. It's just kind of in through the nose, out through the mouth slow breathing, calm my mind, look up at the stars, start projecting my thoughts or imagining that I was projecting my thoughts, visualizing it, you know, like visualizing that my intentions were kind of resonating out from my mind, which I, I don't know if that's like an easy thing for everyone to do. I'm not sure. I don't know. I've always had a very visual mind so I can mm -hmm. see things in my mind quite easily. So I, I was able to like visualize almost like the energy of my thoughts going out from me. You know, and when I got into these states where I was really feeling it, where I genuinely felt like there was some weird energy and a resonance and I was, you know, maybe my body was tingling a bit, that kind of basic meditative onset that people experience where their body starts kind of getting these weird energy flows and that stuff would happen. And then I would see like a flash of light in the sky and I would see a number of satellites coming over, like at the beginning of having these experiences. And by the way, I can shut up in a second because I have talked for quite a while. If you want to, no, it's good. You're good. By You're all good. means, interrupt. But yeah. you know, when I first started doing this, it suddenly 
had I started seeing all of these different weird things in the sky that I'd never seen before. And I've been someone who's always watched the sky. I've always loved looking up at the sky. I, I grew up primarily like from the age of seven onwards in North Wales out in the countryside where it's just like, you know, like zero light pollution. So I'm used to seeing a lot of stars and meteorites and satellites and all sorts of stuff. To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email thrillglassdarkly ads at gmail.com. And what I was seeing was just different, man. Like I was seeing like 15 to 20 satellite looking objects. And they did look like satellites, just little white orbs of light up mm -hmm. in space. But I would be seeing like 15 or 20 of them within about five minutes, just like one there. Okay, now one there, now one there. Oh my God, no, there's one there, there's one there, there's one there. And I was just like, this is weird. Like it's getting like really busy in this area. And I, I wasn't were 100 percent Yeah, go were on. they moving like satellites, like a like kind of a parabolic arc, or were they Yeah, at, like, like this is the, this is the thing. This is like and, and I've said this mm -hmm. a number of times. I I kind of get the sense that this whole phenomenon, at least what you're experiencing when you interact through this whole kind of modality of consciousness and, and making these requests it feels to me like there's like this baby steps program so it starts off really quite subtle and not too alarming so yeah it just looked like satellites it just looked like satellites they behave like satellites and for all i know a, a fair amount of them could have been satellites all i'm saying is that the influx uh, the amount was just not normal it was not normal it was just like i was seeing far too many of them and it was weird so anyway that was how it first started was i was going out in the evening getting into this state of mind, projecting the intention that I wanted to have some form of a contact, that I wanted somebody to turn up if universal consciousness is true. And honestly, I mean, you know, people might like roll their eyes at all of this, but I actually do think it's really important to be grounded in a state of love and positivity. So I was mm -hmm. genuinely like in this state of, you know, if you believe love is the fundamental force of all reality, if you believe consciousness is the kind of like, you know, the, the building block upon all things, like come and say hello. Like that's basically what I was saying. Like, you know, really weird shit, <laughs> really weird stuff. You know, that I was like, you know, most people would think that this is just crazy. That Why would you be doing this? But it felt right to me and things started happening. So you'd see these satellite type objects turn up then they would start to glow and flash not all of them but some of them as they came over i'd look up i'd see this white orb but like you know kind of send a thought in my mind i know it sounds crazy i know i could just be sending my thoughts to elon musk's satellites that probably has happened a number of times well, but well you would you would know if you saw starlink star well, this is the thing though like i'm sure i've like seen a number of satellites and been sending thoughts to just a piece of inanimate metal but there are times where 100 it's not satellites and so some of these times where you'd be looking at this little satellite looking object coming across the sky you send a thought and then suddenly it would glow and flash really brightly and then recede back down and i know about iridium satellites and the kind of like flares that can happen when it catches the light but you when it receded have... back down did it disappear or did it continue movement well this is the thing is it 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 continued moving but then okay. it flashed again and okay. then again yeah that ain't a meteorite <laughs> No, no, no. Right. And, and it wasn't right. flashing. So it wasn't flashing sequentially. It wasn't sequential. It was literally like flash. And I was like, holy shit. I'm like, oh my God, it just flashed. Like, are you, are you something? Flash. Wow. Can you do that again? Flash. Like that kind of thing. Like re creepily responsive to my thoughts. And that's where my interest got really peaked. I was like, okay, something is happening. So I started going out every single night. I started doing this every single night in like 2019 in August. And this is when I had the experiences that actually led to me creating Project Unity. Before this, I was just doing this on my own. I was, you know, I wasn't talking on YouTube or anything like that. But it was in 2019 that I had my most profound experiences. So I can talk about that if you want. I just need to take a breath and drink a bit of coffee because I'm going to run out of oxygen. Yeah, I'm going to ask, I'm going to throw you a curveball. So you right. live in Wales, right? So this is coming at you from like a passport. Well, I, I, I don't live in Wales anymore. I, I grew up in Wales, but I don't live there now. So where did this happen? Did it happen in Wales? This happened happen? here. No, this happened here in this literal house. Like my garden's just outside. And where are you based? What part of? I'm in Nottingham, which Americans call Nottingham. 
Yeah, the Sheriff of Nottingham, right? That's it. Yeah, Robin Hood, yeah. Sheriff of Nottingham, yeah. all that. Yeah. Okay, so I could still ask the same question, but I think Wales is more resonant with this sort of lore. So this is kind of like a passport of Magonia sort of question. Is there any like old lore about the Fae and stuff like that in Wales or Nottingham? Oh, I mean, absolutely. In in Wales, I mean, the the old cultures of Wales are the Celtic cultures and like pagan cultures. So our mythology is steeped in fairies and gnomes and sprites and all that kind of stuff. Like that's, I think, a lot of that, uh, you know, is illustrated in uh, a lot of traditional English literature and stuff like that. You can see the the folklore quite prominently. So yeah, there's definitely that. And also in Wales, interestingly enough, where I actually grew up is a UFO hotspot, uh, Denbyshire, mm-hmm. Denbyshire or Denbyshire is one of the listed hotspots in the UK for UFO activity. Not only that, but I grew up at the base of a kind of like, I want to say mountain to make it sound better. It's basically a really big hill. It's a pretty big hill though. It's got a summit with a, like fort, a, a fortress thing on top of it. It's not really a mountain, but it's called Molvamai, M-O-E-L-F-A-M-M-A-U. That's in Welsh, not English, Molvamai. And mm. uh, at the top of this mountain, hill, mountain, whatever, there's a half-finished Egyptian obelisk <laughs> that was being constructed for the Queen's Jubilee. And they never finished it because of like structural issues or something, but it's kind of like this half finished fortification that you can go up onto the stairs of and like, you know, look out over the amazing countryside that you can see around that area. But that is an Egyptian obelisk. And apparently Molvamai sits on a ley line. So you've got a mountain in Denbyshire, which is a UFO hotspot with an Egyptian obelisk on top of it, directly on a ley line. So go nuts with what you want to theorize about why so that's if, all going on there. But so for the audience that doesn't understand, doesn't know what is a ley yeah. line, right? So I don't really know what a ley line is because there's a lot of different interpretations. Like there's like the whole kind of spiritual idea of like these are kind of like the the, the conscious energy grids of the planet and of like Gaia, and that these are kind of like concentrated areas of energy. But there's also a, a, a genuine geomagnetic grid line around the planet. And these lines are also what people call ley lines, like these kind of like geomagnetic grid works around the planet. So I think that's kind of the interpretation. I think it's also interesting that the, they are associated with this whole kind of like geomagnetic anomalies, like electromagnetic anomalies, because there is something to be said about electromagnetism and the role it plays in like the whole phenomena and with UFOs and with mm-hmm. other types of anomalous phenomena. Electromagnetism seems to be one of the uh, kind of ways in which they influence in the physical world somehow through electromagnetism, whether it be influencing electronics or whatever. But yeah, so ley lines, I think, are kind of considered to be basically the electromagnetic energy lines of the planet. But some people also believe that there's a a deeper, more esoteric and kind of spiritual or astral role that they play that perhaps they thin the lines between dimensions or, you know, different slices of reality. So yeah okay so going back to your path sorry i did i'm going to ask questions like that from time to time no 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 it's fine i want you to interrupt because i have (laughs) people people tell me this as well in the comments that i talk too much i mean that's kind of the point of being someone on youtube i guess but i do tend to just go and go so just just tell me to shut up if you need to all right go ahead (laughs) okay so carry on with my experience yeah yeah Yeah, okay have you heard this before by the way yeah, but my audience may not have. So right. okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was just curious yeah. to know if you if you'd heard the. Uh, but that's why I'm asking you these kind of sideball questions that yeah, get a different yeah, perspective. No, I, I I like it. So basically, in August 2019, I had a series of experiences with orange orbs, orange orbs of light, not white satellites, not flashing lights, but orbs of light, and on two occasions well on one occasion they came very close on another occasion they were pretty close but i saw them on four separate occasions across the expanse of about a month and a half starting in august and the first time wait you wait, saw, let me stop you right there you saw them yeah. in august yeah august 2019 
Okay, that's really strange. Okay, that is really, really just Why? to relate Why? relate a story. So, I've had no overt experience with the phenomena, uh-huh. except maybe one night in August. Oh, interesting. It was very in early two, in the in morning. Two, in 2019 or just in August? N- no, not 2000. It was in 2022. And you have to be careful too in 2022. Well, I'm assuming if it's, if it was anything like August 2023, that's when you have the Perseid meteor showers, me, uh, yeah. you know, and then, and every time I see something in the sky that I want to think, I always check to see if there's meteor, like if there's any meteor showers oh, yeah. going on at the time. Right. And it turns out it's always like, oh, okay, that's the Perseid. It's a, it's a draconid, whatever. Yeah. But I'm just kind of like go outside between one and 2 a.m. And the sky just lights up. And for about half to one and a half seconds, it's so fast that my brain like could only process it in retrospect. Mm-hmm. But it was almost as if an orange orb of the size of a basketball flew about nine feet, not quite above me, but to my kind of left. It was heading just trying to get this right north northeast yeah northeast just very quickly and it's kind of up a hill and then down a hill gone oh, and yeah. when it happened to me I, I ruled out i was i mean it was clearly not a drone there was no way it was a drone there was no way it was a flare i know that because i spent five years in the army and i used flares routinely like illumination rounds things like that the only thing I think that it could potentially be would be some teenager shining a spotlight from behind my house on and off. But even that doesn't quite explain mm-hmm. it. So I'm not saying it's an orb, but the orb is the only reasonable explanation I can come up with. It, but it happened in August, and that's the only reason. But that was my... I would love to go under hypnotic regression to recount it because it happened so fast. Yeah. It was like an after image was burned on my eyes. Anyway, that's the story. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've considered the whole hypnotic regression thing. It would have to be done by someone that was trustworthy, incredible, but I'd be interested in doing it because there are certain elements of the first experience that I had with these orange orbs that I don't know if it's directly associated, but it, if it is, it, it makes me a little uncomfortable. But yeah, basically, I was in my back garden and I was doing what had become at this point basically my usual routine because I basically got religious at this thing. I was going out every time trying to see this stuff. And it's funny because of the way in which it was introduced to me again, this is what I think was important. The way in which it was introduced to me because it was so synchronistic and subjective and personal and, you know, dare I say spiritual, it felt like an answer from the universe. There was no fear. I don't know if that's rational or not. Like, you know, you're doing something really crazy. 100%. When this happened, I had no, like zero fear. It was just like, what's up with that? You know, like I was not scared. I was just kind of like, oh, that's interesting. What was yeah, that? Yeah, but but even like before seeing anything, just the fact that I was going out and trying to invoke an unknown intelligence through the medium of consciousness. This all sounds like some pretty black magic stuff. Like, you know, it's it's the kind of thing people warn you not to do, and you know, the Ouija board and, and stuff like that. And and I guess maybe that's what made me a little hesitant to do it again. And I also feel validated, like I'm like, it's real. I don't really need to keep asking it to put on a show for me. I know something's real. All I would like is some clarity on what it really is. But the actual need for proof, I'm good, man. I'm good. I've seen it. So basically what happened to me was I was looking up at the sky. I was at the back of my garden looking towards my house and I initially saw a, a flash of light. I've said this a, a number of times. I, you know what? No, I won't skip mm-hmm. through because because I'm so used to saying it. But just in case people haven't heard it, I won't like skip through stuff un- unnecessarily because uh, it'd be better for people to hear it. So I was standing at the back of my garden, looking towards my house. It was nighttime, maybe like 9 30, 10 o'clock in the evening, summertime, and uh, a, a rare warm evening for England. You know, sometimes we actually do get the sun. 
and we get some warmth and it's greatly appreciated. So yeah, it was a warm time, warm summer evening. And I was looking up at the sky, crystal clear sky. And the first thing I saw was a bright white flash of light on the right hand side of my sky. And I was looking at this and this is something that's actually been called a specific thing within the very niche community within the niche of ufology that's already on the fringes of society if you dig into that there's another niche of people that make contact or try to in groups or on their own all across the world and they have terms for certain things that have been seen most commonly so the one thing that they've seen is uh, flash bulbs this is something that's very common and this is something that i saw a lot of now there were the satellites that would come across the sky and flash but there were also times where you would just see a bright white flash of light in a void of space. So it would be a crystal clear sky, bright white flash of light. You look up, maybe you send a thought, maybe you, whatever, you, you do something, you send another thought, and then you'd see another flash of light from the exact same spot, a black void in space, bright white flash. Maybe send another thought and wait a second, bright white flash. And it's like, well, there's nothing there. You can't see, it's not moving and there's nothing discernible. There's no discernible object. It's just a flash of light that's coming from space and it's static. And when it flashes and turns off, you can't see an object. So that's been called a flash bulb. And it's really common. It's like weirdly common. It's like one of the first things mm. people usually see is flashes of light in the sky that have no real object uh, attached to them that you can see. It's very weird. So yeah, I saw a flash of light in the right hand side of my sky and I looked up and I saw it flash again and then again and then again and then every time it flashed it was slightly lower so this thing was going like kind of like this it was flashing going slightly lower each time flashing slightly lower each time again no discernible object but it was just this white flash bright white flash and then it stopped just from my perspective could just be coincidence I don't know if it has any relevance but it stopped above two other stars and kind of created the apex of a triangle. So it was flashing at the top. No, these two stars here, equilateral. Okay. Which does seem to have some relevance to the entire situation when I really think about it. And you'll see why as I go through this. So that was happening, this flash of light. And it was going on for long enough that I just started looking around the sky for other things that might be happening, keeping my eye on it, but panning around, just looking around. And I was looking over to the left-hand side. Bear in mind that I'm at the back of my house. There's like a little garden path. And so I'm looking towards my house. And I look across to the left. And there's like a, a dark cloud. And it's the only cloud in the sky because it's a really crystal clear night. But I kind of did like a double take. I saw this cloud and I kept looking around. Then I turned back to it. And when I turned back to it, I locked my eyes onto it properly and it had a very strange behavior it was exhibiting. This cloud, and it, it's something that you wouldn't see if you were just walking. Like that's what really, if you were the cloud that was not a cloud. Yeah, man, it, was, it wasn't a cloud because if you were just walking, you, you would not think about it. You'd see it, look up, whatever. But it was the double take and it was the fact that I was scanning the sky and I was looking for things and I looked back at this cloud. And when I look back at it, it had this weird, it was subtle, it was pretty subtle, but it had this visible disruption. And the only way I've been able to describe it is if you imagine a cloud, but put like a light amount of TV static, just a light amount, not like really heavy, but just enough where when you're looking at it, it's like fizzling. Shimmers. It's, it's like, yeah, it's shimmering. Like there was something going on. Like it was like energized. It, it was so being weird man i was just like <laughs> what is this and it, it was coming across the so if, if this is my house right and this bright white flash is happening on this side and this cloud is coming across this side right and, th and this is my house it's basically floating like this so it's going to go past my house and it's going to keep going off to the right and and just keep going down and i'm at the back right but this cloud it's coming here and it gets in alignment with my house, like directly in alignment with my house and, and me on this path. And again, it's got this weird staticky looking field effect around it. It gets to my house and it does a complete 90 degree turn towards me. 
So what, what was the wind? On, what was the wind like when you were calm, still summer evening, man? Like a balmy mm. summer evening, no wind really, just a nice calm evening. And even if there was wind, I have never seen in my life a cloud turn at ninety degrees instantly. Like it literally. Imagine looking at a cloud going like that, and then it just does that. It just complete directional change abruptly. And it was so noticeable that my heart skipped a beat because I was staring at it as it was drifting past my house. And then as it got to my house, suddenly it started coming towards me. It was going to be above my head. It was now coming towards me up in the sky. And I was standing on this path watching this cloud coming up, up and over. And eventually it's going to be above my head. And we spoke about fear. I was a little bit afraid at this point. I'll admit I wasn't like terrified, but I was looking at this thing like, what? I, I, I don't even know if it was mesmerized, maybe mesmerized or something like maybe like a little bit of fear, but not like overwhelming. I was just kind of shocked. I think it was just like shock. Like, what did I just see? And I was rooted in place and I was staring at this thing. It just came up and over. It came above my head. And I swear to God, this is the truth. This cloud just went like it just sucked into itself. It just collapsed into itself within a second, second and a half at most. And inside it was a triangle formation of orange orbs of light, these orange circles in a triangle. And there was, I would say roughly, I've kind of, my ballpark has been about 25, maybe 30 of them, big triangle formation of these orange balls. And I don't think it was a vehicle because one, I've seen them since that experience and I don't think they're vehicles or if, if they're vehicles, they, they act on their own or <laughs> independently as these little orbs of light. It wasn't a triangle craft. It wasn't a, a, a vehicle. And I know that because as this thing was literally, and, I, and this happened, it didn't stop. So it was coming over. The cloud did this thing. It showed what was being obscured by this cloud, which I now have to imagine with some sort of cloaking mechanism that makes it look like a cloud, some sort of mimicry. And this formation just kept going. So I had to turn around and, and watch as it just kind of kept going off in, into the distance. And as I was watching it, I could see that some of these orbs were actually swapping place in the formation. So they were just kind of like maneuvering around and kind of swapping different areas of the formation, but maintaining this like squadron of orbs. And once I like sobered up from what I'd seen, cause I think I just stared at the sky for like a few minutes and I just, I phoned my mom. I remember I phoned my mom. I was like, I've got to tell someone. I was like, I've got to tell someone what I was just saying. Like, God bless her for having to put up with that phone call because she was having like a meal <laughs> and I phoned her up. Like, you're not going to believe what I've seen. I've seen these orange orbs. And like, she straight up thought I'd had like a psychotic breakdown, which I don't blame her for thinking. Like, I sounded crazy. I was like, mom, you're not going to believe what I've seen. You're not going to believe this. But yeah, I did see this. It, it did happen to me. Something happened in the morning. And it's a bit weird. That's the part of the story that I, I don't know if it's directly connected, but it's an element that would be a, a bit weird if it is connected. Do you want me to go into that now? Or do you want to ask me anything or? It's always connected, man. I, I uh, well, f finish the story and then I'll, okay. I'll add more than ask question, but yeah. So, okay. So. Well, this is one of the reasons why I kind of want to get the regression because uh, they could be missing time. I, I phoned my mom. I had this weird conversation with her telling her what happened. And then I think I went to bed. <laughs> like, I think that's it. Uh, that's all I can really remember is like, I, I guess I went to bed after that. Like, I don't really remember what happened after having a phone call, but also this was in 2019 and it's 2023. So I don't know. I, I maybe I've just, I can't really remember what happened exactly after that moment or there's missing time, which is why people have said, oh, well, you should maybe have that looked at. Maybe there's some segment and some sequence that occurred. But anyway, I wake up in the morning. Don't think I had any weird dreams. And then I went into the shower. I got out of the shower and as I was drying myself off, I looked down and I saw immediately on this arm, which has now got a tattoo on it in kind of the place where the, the dots used to be. Immediately, I saw these 
three red dots in a triangle, like a, a perfect equilateral triangle. And they were prominent, like, like the, it, was, it was literally like a case of kind of, you know, getting out of the shower, get a towel. Whoa, like look instantly seeing them the moment. And by the way, that's like, common. That's common. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's what freaks me out about it, man. Is like, you know, I, mm. I, I think part of my brain wants to go, oh, like it could be some weird thing. But no, the likelihood really... of it not being connected is probably connected. And I, I don't know what to think about that. I don't know what to think about that. Because, yeah, they, the, the thing about these marks, there was no bruise. There was no scab. There was no itching. There was no bump. There was no sign of skin trauma whatsoever. Like, there was nothing that would indicate that that had recently happened and, and like, you know, my skin had reacted and there was, you know, pain or healing happening. It had this, each one of these little circles had like a sheen to it that you get from scar tissue, man. Like I've got a scar on my hand from when I accidentally put my hand through a window and cut my hand. And I, I've got like a, a pretty prominent scar going down my, my left hand and it's got that shine to it, you know, and it looked exactly the same. These three marks had this kind of shine and there was no sign of any sort of recent damage. Anyway, those marks stayed on my arm prominently for at least a year, at least a year. And then they faded over time slowly to the point now where even though there's a tattoo, I could see them for a little bit, but they're gone now. I like, can't, can't see anything now, which I guess makes sense to a certain degree. It could be like skin cells dying and moving on. But if it was a scar, you'd think it'd be permanent. Either way, like as you're seeing on the screen, they were just in this kind of equilateral triangle and it stayed for so long on my body and there were no symptoms. And the night before I'd seen a triangle of orbs reveal itself out of a cloud. So, you know, you have to think and put two and two together. And that's where I am with it is like, you know, part of my brain, I don't think wants to put two and two together. Cause if that is them, that makes me feel uncomfortable. You know, well, who is them? Expensive. Them as in whatever the orbs are, you know, like. Why are you yeah. why, we'll, are you branding, we'll why are you branding me with a mark? That's that's weird. Yeah. I mean, it could be it could we could speculate for hours on this, but it could, it could be, be a reaction. Just, I don't know skin reaction. Nah, to that it could also just be a message, right? Like that that the experience was real. Yeah, but like in a, a way little, that doesn't. Yeah, hmm, actually, that's an interesting point. I, I mean, this is this is kind of one of the statements I want to make, which is the moment one starts to delve into this topic and i didn't seriously get into it until about two years ago like throughout my life i've read books and things like that. i read communion when i was in grade school all that stuff but it was kind of a passing interest it wasn't something that i spent more time on because i just you know i'm like oh this is interesting i don't know if he's telling the truth or not but it's right. an interesting story in the last two years, when I kind of started this podcast, I came in through the remote viewing route. And the reason I came in through that route is because I discovered this. We were talking about this before the show. This guy named David Morehouse, who was, he started out as a combat arms officer in the United States Army. I was a combat arms officer in the United States Army. So I'm like, okay, I can read this and I can validate his experiences because I went through the same or similar experiences. So he had a book called Psychic Warrior. I read it. I'm like, holy crap. Like the, our government actually did this stuff with remote viewing. Like it's real. It yeah. works. So there's something there, there. And then through the course of studying that with this channel, there is an undeniable connection between like the nuts and bolts people. I'm sorry. I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't care if I offend people. Like that interpretation is wrong. It's just um, the surface level. It's just the surface level. Uh, yeah. It's part of it. But to deny that there's another non-physical aspect to this is to deny basic quantum mechanics, right? Even matter is a wave. You look at de Broglie's equation. Matter is a wave. And in order to go faster than light, all you really have to do is manipulate that wave to shape space-time so that you can compress the space-time in front of you and expand the space-time behind you. So anyway, I'm, I'm getting off topic. No, but, the but point I'm trying to make it the point I'm trying to make is, as I was going through the study, the synchronicity started piling up. Mm -hmm. Like, just, but for me, the only, I mean, and, and I, I also tried CE5 on three occasions. I, I, well, 
The first two occasions, I never had had success. The third time, I was a little bit crazy about it, and I may have had success, just not in the positive way that you did. So the third time, I went with a group of people to a property that was adjacent to Skinwalker Ranch. Well, that, that's your first mistake. Well, I, I knew, I knew, I knew it was, I knew it was dangerous. Now, what happened subsequently could have just been, you know, natural, right? But as I was sleeping, I was, you know, there was like a chair here and I was sleeping, well, a chair here, I was sleeping like right here, fire in between. And I just have a thought in my head, in my own voice, just said something to the effect of the shadow people are real. Ooh. Could, could have been my imagination could have been my imagination could have been whatever okay i want to yeah, acknowledge that why, why did you have that thought out of nowhere that's, that's the, that's well the there were there were people when the guide kind of took us around there were people who would yeah. report seeing shadow people so okay. it right. was seated like look i'm trying i'm i only care <laughs> about truth i'm not yeah. like so as i was sleeping i had that thought and instant later there's this massive gust of wind <laughs> and then when i woke up the subsequent morning that wind had blown the chair into the fire at me and my you know one of my friends is like yeah i'm like what happened to, what happened to that chair he's like oh yeah I, you were sleeping but like i just pulled it out of the fire it was like so uh, i don't like that <laughs> so to, to to your point we we have to be careful yeah what we reach out to when we reach out to it now to be fair i've had none of the like hitchhiker effects no. or anything like that but we have to be because there are some people who study this field right who I, I just did an interview recently with this guy nathan gillis who thinks that the you know phenomenon is demonic but not demonic in a judeo-christian yeah, a bit of that talk that was on on the collins elite right yeah and and yeah. it's more it's less about theology and it's more about there are entities all around us that are are just playing a different game some might have our interest in at heart some might even in the bible angels can do pr some pretty horrific things well I think, so I think i'm not that. saying that's what it is but i'm just saying i think some of the phenomenon might be interdimensional species some of it might be extraterrestrial some of it might be future humans it might be none of the above it could also be ultra terrestrials like things on this you know that are already here that are guiding our development i i don't know but i have kind of the same view that you do you have to be careful with what you're for lack of a better word summoning yeah well i think that you know at least for me having those experiences demonstrated two things one that your consciousness in some way is not restricted to your body is able mm -hmm. to in some way travel across information mediums and networks across time and space through some form of energy well i don't think, I think it's travel i think it's non-local I, I don't think you have to travel like it's well just... okay so yeah but i mean like you know you could okay so you could look at that like the you know the, the neural network of the universe i mean it's it's still kind of you know strung together through some form of energetic mediums at the baseline of creativity at the quantum level of, you know the kind of quarks and atoms of space and time which we're a part of right now so i kind right. of I, I would say that you're right it's instantaneous because consciousness is instantaneous, but you exist within space and time as a physical creature. So there's like a level of, I would almost look at it like a computer, I guess. I don't know, maybe like a bio computational system. That's what a human being is. And that you can reach out through the internet of the universe, so to speak, if you know how to program your consciousness to do so. Not that I know how to do that. I just think that that might have been what I did accidentally. <laughs> like, you know, I don't know. I can't tell you how to, you know, tune yourself into this stuff. It's just that it seemed to happen. It's a very subtle state of consciousness that you can slip into that I think our ancestors knew a lot more about in terms of our shamanic ancestors. We've lost a, a science of consciousness. We've gained a different type of science and we've lost a science of consciousness that I think they had a lot more of a sophisticated understanding of. But yeah, I think that basically I, it made me realize that consciousness is non-local 
and there are intelligences that will respond to you and your requests. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? So, you know, where do you go with that? I have to look at it through the lens of what happened to me subjectively. I read a series of books. These books introduced spiritual and phys- philosophical concepts to me. I then went on a journey of research into those philosophical concepts and developed it further and then got to a point where it was no longer useful to me to have more academic knowledge because I was not feeling like it was serving me. I made a request to the universe consciously that I would like a further adaptation of this journey. Please add another layer onto it. I then get introduced to the concept of contacting this phenomenon. I then have success with contacting this phenomenon. So for me, I have to go from my own subjective journey and Mm -hmm. say that that is inherently what people would call spiritual is in some way guided by something that is beyond space and time because it influenced events in my life that led towards contact becoming a thing that was possible, which it wouldn't have been if I hadn't have had all those previous experiences to lay right. the groundwork. So it becomes very complex. It becomes something that I feel is a little bit too much more than extraterrestrials from planets in the physical space-time construct. It seems to be beyond the space-time construct. Now, now look. Aliens. It could be, right? It might be they're more advanced, et cetera. But I'm kind of with you. I think there's something more to all this. Yeah. And well, I, think, I mean, you know, the the, the, yeah. the typical any advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic thing that is thrown out, which it could be. It could be just so advanced technology that it comes off as magic. But it certainly feels to me that there's a component of inter- intellect within your own life that's responding. And I think that's reality mm-hmm. itself. And I have wondered if this is even anything other than reality responding to you in different ways. If it is a conscious universe, then maybe it's just images from the conscious universe. They have no tangible reality. It's just a ethereal projection that's given to you as a response. I don't know. Like maybe they're not objectively real, but they were certainly real enough to change my idea about reality radically. And then I have to just quickly say that from that point, I created Project Unity. You know, I went out into the forest. I set up a camera on a tree branch away from everyone, just in case. I didn't want anyone hearing me. And I just talked about my experiences and talked about how I believe they were made possible, these ideas around consciousness. It starts growing in popularity over time. Then I start getting guests, you know, then I get connected to different people. It grows, it grows, it grows. And now obviously, you know, I'm at a point where I'm very fortunate that I'm able to connect with a lot of people, get great guests, and and it's a successful podcast that's actually able to, you know, pay the bills and, and is keeping me going. So all of these doors opened up for me, all of these positives, all of these good things, and it changed my life radically. So the reason I'm saying all of that is because a lot of people want to talk about, you know, the manipulation side of it and like, oh, you don't know what you're dealing with. But I have to say that everything was positive that came from it. It inspired so much change. It brought things into my life. It radically altered my way of looking at what reality is. And yeah, sure, I've had plenty of ups and downs since those times, but on a whole, my life has been kind of steadily improving and I'm gaining more knowledge and gaining contact. And so I have to look at it and say like, well, it all has been good. And so I think that's benevolent. I think that thing that you get in contact with is benevolent. I think it is in some way rewarding you for stepping into a higher threshold of consciousness, even if it's only for a moment, because my God, man, we're all just like so out of touch with our own consciousness that it's like a fleeting moment. And I think that's all I was able to achieve was a fleeting moment a couple of times where it was like, the signal was happening and it was like, yeah, there you go. I'll, I'll turn up and show you that I can hear you. And that changes your way of behaving in reality. So yeah, I, I don't know if you'd ask me a question or not, but I'm just basically- No, 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 we're-, we're, what, we're I'd learn. That's what I'd learn from it. My gut tells me that most of it is positive, but you need to be careful because there's an element that, again, I'm a Catholic, right? And you know, the Catholic Church performs exorcisms and they perform exorcisms yeah. for a reason. 
Oh yeah. No, I'm not. I, I, I'm not. I think as as above, so below, man. Like I think it's just a it's it's as above, so and it's how your energy is. It's what your intention is. Like I I don't care if people laugh at me for it. I was radiating love and light and hippy dippy. Mm-hmm. Like that's what I was in. I would not want to be going out there and going like I am summoning the dark and hate energy. Like you know, I give right. me. Why would you do that? Like no, no, no. Like you know. So yeah, I kind of like think it's really how you bring yourself to that party. That yeah. who, who gets invited to that party is very much dependent on you. Well, the, so for me, a lot of these synchronicities happen with nature. Again, I fully acknowledge this could just be, you know, maybe where I live. But like, you ever have an owl, like a great horned owl, just land in your backyard and just like sit there and you are able to walk up to it? Like nine I feet that, away. I, I have had a weird bird experience, but it's not the same. It's not that. I have nothing but weird bird experiences. Right? <laughs> I, I've had like hummingbirds fly up to my window and like oh, cool. look in, check me out. I mean, literally, that happened. That happened. Let's see. That happened this week. I've had a raven land on my balcony and squawk at me, and then of nice. course I lost a job shortly thereafter. So I tend to get signs in that way. And if I act according to how I'm feeling in the moment, I think like, what am I feeling right now? What's going on? I tend to make the right decisions and I get more of these signs. But again, I, yeah. you know, who, who knows, but I routinely see the hawks, dragonflies, hummingbirds. And that was the first time I've ever seen an adult owl. But, and then there's, of course, the synchronicities, right? Are you familiar with Eric Wargo? No. He he talks about precognitive dreaming and things like that. You start writing down your dreams and it will blow mm. your mind. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I've had, one day I had a dream about the philosophy of Ted Kaczynski. I'm like, why am I having a dream about the philosophy of the Unabomber? What the heck is going on? Have I ever, wake up the next morning. Have you ever read his manifesto? It is weirdly nostradamus in terms of its predictions of what's happening now. Yeah, yeah. It, it, is, it is creepy. I was, I was even considering doing a kind of like a piece on it, but I was kind of umming it yeah, you wanna... because of the controversy, obviously. Yeah, but I think you might. I, I think YouTube might. YouTube might, uh, might have a problem with it. Yeah. Unfortunately. Freedom of speech ain't so free these days. <laughs> Oh, I, we could go. Uh, oh my God, we could go on a whole episode. Yeah, I'm sure, we that, could do a few hours on that alone. I mean, literally, the way you know the truth is not by what they're saying; it's by what they're not saying. Of course, right? Of course, you know, it's it's so transparent these days. I think that's the only good thing about it is that the kind of corporate media landscape has become for a lot of people so transparently biased and bought out and financially captured that. A lot of people are moving on to these types of formats. You know, there are podcasters out there that literally just blow the statistics out of the water when it comes to this stuff. So there is a sea change with the information landscape. But yeah, man, we could talk a whole lot about the integrity of the legacy media or the or the corporate media, especially over the last few years. My God. So I have a dream about this philosophy, right? Yeah, I wake up the next day. I see Ted Kaczynski is trending on Twitter. I'm like, what oh, the heck? Yeah, you see. And then he he, he died, right? So then yeah. I started writing these things down. But anyway, that's just I don't. This is this is not about no, me. It's, it's, it's about it, you. No, but it's interesting, man. Like you know, I've had some really strange dreams. I've I've had two dreams where I've actually died. Like I've I've died and I haven't woken up. I've had an experience. I've had an after death experience in a dream. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, like, I, I, I've really struggled to find a lot of people that have a shared experience of this. I got shot as a world war two soldier and I slowly died out and I had an experience. I can tell you it's crazy. It's so, weird. I bet you again, I don't want to get go too far down this path, but okay. I mean, it could be a memory of a reincarnation. I right? think it was because it was. So let's let, let's like uh, go through it. Actually, this is this is fascinating. Well, I think it was just because it was the most real dream I've ever had in my life. Like there was no abstract 
dreaminess to it. It was just, I was a World War II soldier storming the beaches of Normandy in D-Day. Like, I remember literally on a U-boat, you know, U-boat deploys onto the beach, fight my way up the beach, into the bunkers, killing Germans. Then I'm going to, it jumps, like the dream kind of jumps a bit. I'm in a convoy, in the back of a convoy with a bunch of other guys going down a, a, a dirt road. And then it jumps again and I'm on patrol and I'm in a forest and I'm literally first person. I'm holding what looks like an M1 Grand. I've got the uniform. So an American soldier. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Cause I was, okay. I was holding what looked like an M1 Grand and you know, I was in, in uniform and I was walking through a forest, like this kind of sun dappled forest, really beautiful, actually the like meadow alone. And then I heard a whistle like really quick. Like I heard this whistle and I felt a thump absolutely like heavy hit my chest, like this thump and I fell back. And I remember I fell back onto the ground <laughs> and like, I can still see it in my head so clearly it creeps me out, man. Like I fell back and I immediately put my hands on my chest and started applying pressure. Like I, I knew to do that immediately as I was doing that. And I was lying on my back, looking up at the canopy, you know, and I could feel the warmth of blood between my fingers. I could feel it. And I was just lying there, breathing, pushing down on my chest, looking up at the meadow, up at the canopy. And I just started breathing, man, like just kind of like really deep, like trying to calm myself down. You know, I knew I was screwed, but I was just trying to breathe and the corners of my eyes started getting blurry like this was so typical like i've blacked out before i've had moments like that in my life where i've blacked out like the peripheral started getting blurry around the trees as i was breathing it started getting darker and darker and darker and my breath started echoing in my head so it was like really like <sighs> and i was just like echoing and everything was getting drowsy and dizzy and it closed up like the light closed up until it was just black and I could still hear my breathing echoing in my head, echoing in my head. That's all I could hear at this point. Couldn't see anything. And then my breathing just stopped. Like I just took my last breath. Like I just breathed out and then I stopped breathing. I couldn't feel anything, just darkness, but then nothing else. Like I didn't wake up. Like I was just in darkness. And I was like, I remember having thoughts. I was like, am I dead? Am I dead? Like, what's happening? Am I dead? I'm still thinking, I'm still thinking. And then I felt this incredible sense of inertia, this pulling. Like I was like, <laughs> like I could feel like I've been pulled. Like vibrating, just, right? Vibrating, but 100% moving forward, like moving forward in blackness, like just pure blackness. But inertia like i could feel my gut my non-existent gut at this point but i could feel something i could feel the force of it i don't remember how i transitioned to this but i ended up in a stone courtyard like this old stone courtyard big stone courtyard and it had all these stone arches in different areas i was looking around this courtyard all of these different stone arches but it was black you couldn't see where those arches went it was just always kind of like you know black gateways dark gateways it wasn't like scary but it was just like an old courtyard and you couldn't see where those archways were leading and there were other people in this courtyard and i was just like what well, where am i where am i i went up to someone i remember i went up to someone i was like where where am i like do you <laughs> where is where what is this place and they were like, I don't know. I don't know where I am either. <laughs> and then I woke up. Yeah. So when you were, you were lying down mm. in this forest. Yeah, man. Was it spring, autumn? Yeah, it was like winter, like spring. It's like, it was beautiful. It was, I, I, I still remember that. It's almost like I actually remember appreciating it when I was lying on the floor or something. It was like a sun dappled green kind of springtimey look to the forest it was a nice day it's a nice nice day in the forest to die i guess could have picked a, a worse place did you think of any analog 
to, to today? Was it like Black Forest, Germany, something like oh, that? Oh, nah, it's too hard to place. I have no idea. It just looked like, you know, green grass and green trees, like green leaves. And it was hard to, you, I have no idea. You notice anything about your uniform, any patches, anything like that? No, I can't remember those specifics, man. I just remember having a rifle that looked a lot like an M1 Grand, and I was certainly in some form of a green uniform. Like I was definitely in uniform, and I was on my own. Interesting. Yeah. I just hit Do you have a whistle and impact. Crazy. Random question for you. Do you have a birthmark on your chest? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. I actually have like a weird, but it's not like a birthmark. It's just like a tiny little kind of like pink biscuit. I don't think it's actually a birthmark. It's just, it's too small. I don't think it's like that. Did, I I don't know. Did you have it since you were born? Yeah, I've always had it, but it's just like a. It's very small. It's only like it's like a slight pigmentation change in the skin. I don't think it's. Yeah, but it, but a, a an entrance wound is pretty small. It's true. It could be. I suppose it's around, kind of just below my heart. So yeah. I guess you know it's you know it's it sounds tell, that's a common thing too. Yeah, it dude honestly when I woke up from that <laughs> I mean it stayed with me. It's, it was a number it was like three years ago, four years ago, maybe even more. I, I've never forgotten it. And weirdly enough, I, I won't go into the whole thing, but I had another dream maybe like a couple of months later where basically the same thing happened, except the situation was different and the death was quicker. I got shot in the head in what seemed to be an assassination. I was running through a communal gardens. I woke up, I literally went into the dream running in a communal gardens, like, you know, those kind of like commune places where they have different greenhouses, everyone's growing vegetables in like a little community. I was running through one of those. And I remember I ran into this greenhouse and I, I went in and I docked behind this shelving unit and I was hiding. And I remember this leather glove, like, open the door. I just remember this leather glove, open the door. I can't remember the, the person or anything. I just remember seeing the glove. And they pulled out a suppressed pistol. They pointed it at my head. And I remember just going, I won't swear, but I said, like, just effing do it. Like, I, I remember I, I turned my head to the side and was like, just effing do it. Like, just do it. Just do it. And then instantly I was traveling in darkness. Like, like he obviously shot me in the head. And the same feeling that I had when I was slowly dying out on the forest floor happened to me with this other dream, but it happened instantly. And the only reason I could imagine is because I got instantly killed instead of slowly dying. But the sensation was exactly the same two times. If, what they're, time if, they're, period? Real, if they're real, I've been taken out a couple of times, dude. I hope this time it's a bit smoother. <laughs> what, get shot again. <laughs> what time period was this? felt more modern it's hard to place it because i was just running through like a communal garden so it's really i i can't remember seeing anything that was maybe like, i mean look I, again Probably i'm like not saying anywhere between be like the eight, 80s to present day like i don't know 70s to present day or something yeah, yeah when hard you get, to place if, i don't know i can't remember what the gun was can't, when, can't when, what year were you born i should do the math 95 basically. january 95 but maybe before 95 yeah it could be could be it was just weird that it was the exact same sensation of traveling through a dark space with this inertial feeling. I didn't end up in a courtyard. I just woke up, but it was the same feeling, but it came on instantly. That's what you need to do. Hypnotic regression. Uh, yeah. regression for. I guess there's a few things I need to tick off the hypnotic regression list. Uh, you know, yeah. it's, but I, I've looked and I've t tweeted and I've asked and like, really, I have not found many people. I think I've found like one or two people that have said that they've had an experience of dying in a dream and not waking up straight away, like having some form of an experience or like, it's not common. It's not common. And I've had sleep paralysis. I've had weird sleep paralysis as well. A few times. I, I've, uh, yeah, I've had that. I've had mm, that too. But oh, it's awful. I, I hate that shit. I hate it. But I can generally break out of it. Yeah, I just go too. into a rage. And that, <laughs> and that gets me out. Cause I never, I like it. I never recall or see figures. Mm. Cause I think whatever does it knows that I will grab them by the throat and like, good for you, bro. So they don't, yeah, it, it doesn't I, seem, I, or, yeah, maybe I, I just have bad memories. I don't know. I had one in, when I was in Morocco that kind of crept, uh, it freaked me out because it was like a voice and it was like saying stuff in what I th thought was Arabic. And I was like, that's kind of creeping me out because I feel like I'm, being cursed by some old spirit in Morocco or something. Cause it was like this really weird. I was like locked in place in my bed and I just heard it's like, <sighs> it's like creepy voice, like this weird kind of like whispering voice. Oh, oh. 
freak me out. All right. It's on that note, I think I, I think we went like 10 minutes over on this episode. So let's end it here <laughs> and let's start because I thought it was, I mean, I. This okay. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. No worries. All right. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you on the next episode. Pleasure. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than give me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of an expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site, and there's also you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, a Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.